Let's stand by for picture. We have three rounds, full loads. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's just test the jack. That's Tom is set. That's it. <laughs> For Tom, he never wants to hand something off to a stuntman. I mean, he has the skills to do that. Three, two, one, action! He was willing to do jumps, ride at high speed. It's really amazing. The physicality of a character comes through, and it's storytelling for me, and it's how can I best bring the audience into the story. He's fearless. And when you have an actor like that, you want to take advantage of it. Action! It was important to me and to Tom that when we're in the bubble ship, it feels like we're really flying this thing. I'm coming in hot. It's able to do things that a normal helicopter or jet are not able to do. So we built a gimbal that was able to spin in all these different axes to provide the motion of the bubble ship. Good one. Circle that. We just tested it in its first run um, with all the straps in uh, so that we can simulate all the flying motions and the flying battle sequences that we have on the movie. Tom, I just your foot right up here. We did the test. I went through to make sure it was safe. And there's certain things you had to make sure you didn't have your hands outside the windows at certain times. Is that to protect the bubble ship in case it comes off? There's the bubble ship. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do this half speed. Okay, let's do it. Okay, in three, two, one, go. You know, it, it was a violent rig. It would spin and twist and go upside down. It was it was like a very intense roller coaster. Can we go a little faster? For someone like Tom, he couldn't wait to get in that thing. I mean, that's just the type of guy he is. He loves to fly helicopters, airplanes, bungee jump. That's what he lives for. For other people, it's a challenging thing to do. Olga's never been on any kind of a gimbal like this before, but uh, you know, we slowly acclimate all of our actors into a position where they feel comfortable. The bubble ship is a beautiful creation when it's just standing on the ground and I observe it from far away. Ha have fun. Olga will tell you today she wasn't scared, okay? But she was scared. <laughs> okay, here you go. Ah! You don't want to be in there when it's flipping around. I want to play Victoria! <laughs> Can we switch? She's very brave. She toughed it out. And her performance in a lot of scenes of the movie is priceless because it's real. It's not acting. In the end, I liked it, actually. I have to admit it. But don't tell anyone. I pretended like I didn't. <laughs> but uh, I secretly did. You did great. You it's got Olga. Yeah. I wanted Jack to have multiple modes of transport, and a motorcycle made perfect sense. It could fit right in the back of the bubble ship. So we built a bike for him. My name's Justin Cowell, and I have a company called Glory Motor Works, and we build stunt bikes and movie motorcycles. Generally, you know, I'll go into a movie and they'll say, we need the bike to go 30 miles an hour in a straight line, that's it. I go, okay. And then we get on set and we jump at 30 feet and we go 100 miles an hour and we ride it down hills and up mountains. So we built this bike to be able to do supercross. This is the bike we start with. The dirt bike platform was a natural platform to start with. Easy to maintain, easy to work on, and ideal for the climate we're working. <laughs> they're, they're insanely fun bikes to ride. I love motorcycles, and you know, it was a tricky design. The soft stuff, it does really well. It does well, yeah. yeah. But it was. Just because it's been ergonomically changed a little bit yeah, with all this stuff, right. but it works it's great. It works, it's good. Yeah, it's right. Look, man, it's, it's a motorcycle. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Tom's a really good rider, you know, which makes our job easy. And knowing his riding abilities and what he's going to want to do, we're able to prepare for it instead of being surprised. 
guys that designed it did a sensational job because there's moments that I have to carry Olga in the bike and I'm riding through Iceland and it had to be safe enough for me to travel at very high speeds uh, without a helmet. A lot of the stuff I think that's extremely successful are the helicopter shots where he's free riding through pristine Icelandic chocolate cake dirt. It's basically a motocross heaven. Hey, on you, Tom, on you. Go, go, go. He dumped the bike, but he was in full control of the situation, and his agility basically saved him. Okay, here we go. Ready, and three, two, one, go, go. I know it was tricky for them to really figure out the balance of that bike, but I had a blast riding that. get to see him rappel into the New York Public Library, and he has some really cool stunts down there. This is a big stunt show, and uh, that stuff has to be thought of as you're designing the set from all the rigging and, and everything that has to happen in there, and all the pyro and all the explosions. So the set had to be big. It's a big action sequence that plays out in there. <laughs> when we first started designing the set, we had major collapses architecturally. And Joe thought, you know what, I'd rather be more like a tomb and have it a little bit more intact. That sense of discovery, finding elements of our world embedded in this landscape to me was something that I thought was very intriguing. In that scene, Tom comes right down through the ceiling through a classic painting that's in the top of the library. OK, uh, let's take him up, guys. We're basically preparing Tom uh, and getting him to ride a wire and be comfortable. Okay. It hurts, but let's no. let's see what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> we test everything out and then give him the information. He digests the information and is able to perform the stunts usually better than 99% uh, of all stunt people. Okay, uh, let's take him up. You want to counterclockwise or clockwise? Spin. What are you doing? When we were working on the library set, we had several different shots that we had to accomplish in there. We had uh, eight ratchets, and as they pull in, they rapidly accelerate the movement up or out or down or wherever it may be. my conversations with Joe early in the beginning, who really wanted to amp this sequence up. Well, what I want to do is I want him to roll, and I want his gun to go sliding off that way. OK. okay. So head this way, rolls into a close-up, watching his gun go right. over the edge. It's a, what, 30-foot drop, 25-foot drop? 30, 35. I imagine, because this table is under the sinkhole, it's rotted. Right. So then he would basically go to the floor. And then kind of roll out of that. OK. Like Watching my gun go. go this way, you'll see my face. Because yeah. the point is, Firing down the head, we're gonna you want to see my face, we're not going to have to use cuts. Off. It's got to be a one oh, shot. I do the stunts because you can put the camera in places where you may not necessarily be able to put it if I don't do the stunt. That's how we bring the audience into the action. OK, hey, Tom, are you set? Set! OK. Ready! It. It's very hard on the body. Take after take after take. Yeah. 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 He's up for anything. He really can do all those stunts on his own. Three, two. What we're uh, shooting on now is a set of Raven Rock where Three drones have entered the sanctuary for all the scavengers. Spread out! This is the oldest power plant in New Orleans. It was erected in 1885. 
It's a solid steel and brick structure, hand riveted, and it was the original powerhouse from New Orleans. And approximately 36 years ago, they closed it down. It's perfect for this movie. So you can't tell where the set begins and where the original structure is. I mean, they've done such an amazing job with just adding bits and pieces. Yeah. It has been one of the most challenging places to shoot from a, a safety standpoint. We've got to really, really make sure that everybody's in the proper position when we go. It was a total shithole. I mean, it's not often that you're on a multi-million dollar movie set and you're having to wear a helmet in case parts of the set fall on your head. Clear everybody back there behind you. Three, two, one, go. Drone is chasing everybody. And in the process, a few of us get hit by the drone. Our job is to elevate ourselves to the point where our visual effects brothers can disintegrate us. It's a very big sequence. A lot of people, really tight spaces, a lot of big gags. Hi, how are you today? We have 120 background survivors coming in. It's a big makeup and hair day for our team. I am becoming um, a she scared. I am apparently the only female scared. We've had about 30 stunt performers. We've had maybe over 100 pyro explosions. We have a mortar and a, a propane popper right down here. And uh, we just uh, been throwing debris and fire, and we have sparks. The events here are, and the explosions is 1 through 15. Action! Fight cover! Doug McQuarrie, and I'm the technical advisor. I handle a lot of the military movement for the actors. I watch what Stunts is doing, um, and then I start to flesh out how this character is going to shoot and move. At the end of the second act, there's a, a reveal that Jack is not who he thinks he is. And that realization, you know, it was important that it be done in the most dramatic way possible. I couldn't think of a more dramatic way than to actually have to physically fight yourself. I've never done anything like that before. We rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it before we shot on location. And the stunt guy I was working with was outstanding. What happened was I sent a happy Easter text to Joe, and he was like, happy Easter, how tall are you? So I sent him my information. He's like, I might have a job for you. Here we are at the sand pit from the Jack versus Jack fight. Hey, Mark. I have to fight myself, so I have to learn both sides of the fight. The confusion about fighting yourself is knowing that your approach to fighting is the same. They're both as fast as each other. They're both as intense as each other. They know how to counter each other. You can just tell you're freaked out rather Nobody than being too commanding and in control. It's almost like they know each other's moves. The way that it was birthed, basically, is I stood in front of a mirror. Drop your weapon! And I had to try to figure out how I was going to fight myself. Tom Cruise would imagine he was looking at himself, and I would just pretend I looked like Tom Cruise. <laughs> It's a very challenging sequence, primarily because we are in the heat. Uh, they're wearing leather suits. The suit itself was like a sauna. I've never felt such extreme heat in my life, actually. And action. We could only do it one time, and then we started getting dehydrated. The body was just too hot. We had two days to do it, and there were a lot of setups. Everyone was just, you know, they were rushing me through the makeup. OK, guys, just turn Tom into Jack 2 right now, and we'll put Lloyd in as Jack 1. Let's get him ready right away. That's nice. That's good. Yeah? Cool. Happy with that? Yep. The markers are just so that visual effects has something to track. So if there's ever a shot where my face comes into frame, then they'll be able to put Tom's over top. This yeah, is a full head replacement, so there's no hiding either of your faces. What they're going to take from when you play the other side is just your facial performance. At some point, so I would wear a hood with tracking markers so they can do a full head replacement for uh, certain shots. Three, Ready? two, one, go. Boom. Yeah. This was what was actually shot on set, and we have Tom on one side, and then and the next day we take, we have Tom on the other side. And with a bit of rotoscoping, we're actually 
able to put them both together. So I'm actually not really in the movie, but yeah. <laughs> in a good way though. <laughs> Sounds fade. Set. Action. It was really one of the most challenging sequences in the movie to shoot, and just the physical endurance required by Tom to pull it off was astounding. All right. Great job, Tom. Great job, Lloyd. Really awesome. It was quite a challenge, and I really appreciate a great crew, because it's moments like that where you don't get that unless you have a crew that's really working together and moving through the shots and working as a team. That's what's wonderful about making movies. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Tom Cruise 21 seconds! Woo! That was awesome! The bubble ship is Jack's main mode of transport. The inspiration for it came from a Bell 47 helicopter hanging up in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it's a classic design, big glass bubble on the front, has beautiful visibility, and crossing it with the most modern fighter jet, you come up with the bubble ship. You just see it, it's very unique. I just, I haven't seen anything like this before. Very, very early on, Joe started working with a, a concept artist, a comic book guy named Andre Wallen. He kind of did the first pass at it. And then we got Daniel Simon involved. And Daniel's been kind of carrying the torch for the bubble ship. The ship is a two-seater lightweight surveillance and maintenance ship. And in the concept of the whole design process, it was given that it should look kind of insect light and really lightweight. It's a futuristic take on aviation, so we reduced everything to the minimum that we could find on real helicopters. We actually got to build the full-size ship. We had met a company called Wild Factory on Tron. One of the things that they brought to the table was they had been making car prototypes for car shows, and it took several months to do. We spent six months. We had designed the bubble ship down to every bolt, and these guys were able to take those kind of plans and build this spectacular vehicle. What Bradley and I are doing is actuating these doors and, and um, automating them so that they will open during the filming. This is a motorcycle bay, I think, where they bring out a uh, motorcycle. The bubble gives so much visibility uh, to C Tom Cruise's character because it's a, it's a patrol vehicle. Everything he needs is visibility. The diameter of this glass sphere is almost two meters. Tom, he had some input on the controls to make sure it felt as realistic as possible with the foot pedals and the control stick. The drawings and the concept art, Joe would just show me this stuff, and I just thought, oh, man, this is so cool. You know, I'm a pilot. Uh, I love stuff like that, and they designed it to fit to my body. Uh, Tom has spent so much time in this vehicle that we had to design the seat so it's as comfortable as his uh, TV couch at home. I mean, the lumbar support, the height of the seat rest, everything was totally tailored to him. For the first time, the team now tries to put the whole fuselage on the landing gear and to find out if the weight of the ship will be carried by that. There we go. It's a huge relief to confirm that it's going to work. We're finishing this now in California. Then it goes to Louisiana for the interior shooting. The bubble ship comes to Louisiana. We're going to build this thing from the ground up. It'll be an all-day process for us to, to build this thing. Not even the guys from Wild Factory have seen these, this thing assembled yet. So it's going to be a surprise for everybody involved. There'll come a time where these guys will start working like a pit crew, and figuring out how fast they can tear it down and rebuild it on location. It's beautiful. 
Tom had been involved with the project, so had seen the illustrations and the design evolve over the past year. But uh, yeah, to bring him into that soundstage and, and show him the fully built, fully lit up bubble ship was a real thrill. This is stunning. Great work, guys. Great work. God, that's beautiful. <laughs> Come on. Can I get in? Yeah, please do. As beautiful as it is on screen, to be able to sit in it, it's so beautifully designed. Every piece of it was so smooth and elegant. He loved sitting inside that thing. I think he really got a kick out of it. And it was really exciting to get to share that moment with him. How much does it weigh? The whole ship, about 4,000. Close to 4,000 4, pounds. pounds. The nice. landing gear alone is 1,200. All right. Well, good job, guys. All right. Okay. Okay. So here we are in Louisiana on stage five, and Bubble Ship in all its glory behind me. We worked so hard to get the real feeling into everything. We came up with this very finesse and fragile landing gear. It's actually three legs. At the beginning of the design, we had it the other way around. We had the two legs in the back. Uh, but then the question came up, how do you actually get into this bubble? So an easy solution was to turn it around and we're using the landing gears actually as a step at the same time to get into the cockpit. Visually and design-wise, these guns come from the same family like his rifle because in the philosophy and mythology of the film, everything is designed by Ted. So they have the exact same language, the almost the exact same cooling openings. So for the control panels, that was actually the discussion. Where do we put them? Uh, first, we have them all here in the middle because it looks kind of natural to work here. But uh, Tom Cruise actually had the input that when he flies the ship, he doesn't want to take his hands off the control to work on this. So we had all the other sorts of places where to put it, but we decided to actually go up here because when he flies the ship, he gets this great move that makes for great on-camera action. On the controls, we decided to have a center joystick and a thrust control on the left. This is probably my favorite part of the whole ship because stylistically it combines the sphere with a very edgy volume, so it's very sculptural. And we have an air intake here and look like we even got so far to build these little like protection guys with a remove before flight stuff on it. So man, this is like boys and their toys here. <laughs> well, the whole philosophy for the movie was to try to build everything we could, to try to shoot everything in camera. So it was a real thrill to have that bubble ship with us on set. Ready and action. You have it in stage conditions, which I really control. That's fine. Now you gotta take it out to a location in Baton Rouge where you know heat, humidity, wind, everything is hitting it on a higher temperature. Then you gotta take it over to Iceland and no telling what conditions we're gonna hit. They're gonna be shipped in individual pieces. The cockpit will be in one crate, the body will be in another crate, the engines, everything's gonna basically go in its own separate crate so it's safe for shipping. Not only does it have to look great, but we have to be able to basically tear it down, ship it to another part of the planet where we're working, and put it back together really quickly. For something that doesn't fly, it's done more mileage than most people do in a lifetime. It's, it's basically been shot in Louisiana, 92 degrees and uh, humid. And now it's here in uh, Iceland, 30 degrees and freezing. <laughs> Here's what we do, we just have your foot come down. We'll have the door open, we'll have your foot come down, and you come, and then we just have something to cut away to in the back to the front, and you've got the gun. Yep, ready, and action. And then, uh, then head down, yeah, and then we slide across as he goes down. Hey, Mark! Ready, and action. Being able as a designer to participate on a movie where they build real stuff, is like a, you know, a designer's dream. 
coming true. It's, it's one thing to have drawings or a computer model. It's another thing to walk up to it. Want me to target? It's been a great piece. It's, I'm really proud of it. I love doing movie vehicles, and that one has just been a blast to be a part of. Just a great piece of machinery. <laughs> I want someone to build it so we could fly it for real. Excellent. So should we get these uh, large Tycos at uh, 2.43 then? My interest in M83 goes back to when I wrote that original treatment. I was listening to Anthony's music while writing that original treatment. So to be able to bring him on the actual film was a real thrill. So there is a crescendo starting there, but maybe one. starting right away. Yeah, starting so, right away. So, okay. Working on a movie and an album is, is completely different. It's more like a collaboration, really, with, uh, with the director, Joe Trapanese, and, and myself. Hello, whole team. Yeah. Good, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, man, sir, how are you? How are you doing? He's never done a movie soundtrack before, but his music is not only cutting edge, but it's also very emotional, and it felt like a good fit for this movie. Sam, I'm still on 27? Yes. Great. Here we go, guys. Thank you. I wanted the score to be very electronic, very spacey. The goal was to have something new, original, and that delivers um, power and epicness. Inspiring me with this film is like the landscapes and Joseph Kosinski showed me like a lot of like artworks and, and paintings. I had like this like file on my iPad where I have like all these pictures and was very inspired. I said we do we do one more and then I think we have enough okay. to work with. Okay. Great. As an arranger and orchestrator, I get to take Anthony's sound and Anthony's ideas and melodies and adapt them to this ensemble. The magic of film scoring is in this room because we are relying on the sound to blossom in here and then that's what we're capturing. Great playing, great playing. We break down the music in a, into manageable chunks, basically. We have about 50 strings we brought in, um, really full symphonic size uh, string orchestra. And you might see some trombones and tubas in the back there, eight horns and two trumpets, really nice size ensemble. It's a hybrid score in a way. It, it has electronics and drum kits that you would recognize from M83's music. Last week, we were recording two drummers at once in the same room, which was a real blast because those guys rarely get to play together. And uh, because of that, it was just really good vibes in the room. And they were able to play off of each other and against each other and with each other in ways that we couldn't do just with one drummer alone. We recorded drums, we recorded like orchestra and, and, and choir. Bringing all these 
different elements together. It's a really fun part of the process, and it's, it's all blending beautifully. It sounds original, which is all I wanted. I wanted something, an original sound for an original film. Music and pictures together, it's challenging, but beautiful at the same time, and rewarding when, when you see it on the screen for the first time. I feel like being moved by a movie is one of the greatest thing in the in the world. Everybody I'll make a toast. Make a toast. Oh, wow. yeah. Anthony, Joe, thank you so much for all the hard work and talent. Um, I think it. I couldn't be happier with how it all turned out. I think it sounds amazing. And uh, congratulations. Music one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.